Professor Mozo, what a great pleasure to be with you here at this symbolic site in the Freedom Park here in Pretoria. I'm really very, very glad to be here with you. And uh, uh, particularly glad for us to engage in a conversation, which will be a very formal conversation, about uh, mutual concerns. You have been uh, a, a very, and you are a very important philosopher uh, here in Southern Africa, and uh, you have been one of the uh, most distinguished philosophers emphasizing the idea that there is an African philosophy. That is to say, there is not philosophy in Africa, uh, but there is African philosophy. Thank you, Professor Boaventura. I also would like to thank you. I uh, appreciate very much the initiative that you have taken so that we indeed become involved in conversations. How do you see yourself in this, uh, it's not a competition or a struggle, but it's really a movement to define the specific characteristics of African philosophy. Because if there is an African philosophy, then we have to distinguish it from European philosophy, from American philosophy, from Asian philosophy. Must be must have some specificity. And I'd like to know whether you could uh, elaborate a little bit on that. Now, philosophy as a discipline, we must remember, is a con construct. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. a pure construct. Absolutely. And because it is a construct, we have to contest. I want to go back to your word again. You use the word universal mm -hmm. philosophy. Mm -hmm. This is not my term. But the term that is used. We, yes, I, I get it. But you see, this idea that philosophy is universal mm -hmm. is a subtle, almost inadvertent admission that those who have power have the power to create oneness out of pluriversality. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that already is a point of contestation for me, by virtue of what power. Mm -hmm. Philosophy, given the fact that it arises from the living conditions of human experience, Absolutely. By virtue of this experiential diversity, different questions will arise and also different answers. Mm -hmm. And so, if we want to fit this into the concept of philosophy as a discipline, especially mm -hmm. as a discipline constructed unilaterally mm -hmm. in the name of mm -hmm. universality, and that, 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 that is yeah. really the critical okay. point. Okay, Professor Ramos, as I was saying, we are uh, entering a topic, the topic of Ubuntu, which is one of the words or concepts most talked about, probably misunderstood, probably abused. And um, I think that uh, we are coming to an age in which these concepts, which is part of the struggles, I would, say, I would think even of a, a new wave of decolonial thinking, the, the process that we are in a sense decolonizing the social sciences, decolonizing philosophy. These concepts that in the past were just um, exoticisms, now they become part of the struggle. They become serious concepts in philosophy or social sciences, and they become part of the struggle. For instance, Summa Causa now is in the uh, Equatorian constitution as a concept, a, a catch-all concept. I'm not claiming that I'll be understanding everything very deeply, what you are going to say, but what I promise is that I will be listening deeply, as you say in one of your texts. So I'll be listening deeply. Let's sit down and um, have an, our conversation on Ubuntu, and then I'll ask some issues, as I feel. What is, in fact, Ubuntu? When the Ubuntu was in play, what is, prior to the Constitution, prior to many of all these discussions, prior to all these books on, on jurisprudence, there is, in your view, Ubuntu exactly. as a living philosophical concept of the Bantu people in the region of the world. Explain to me yeah. what is the, is, what is it? Some people say Ubuntu is respect for other people. 
Ubuntu is you may not kill others. That is uh, uh, cataloging. It is not philosophizing. Mm -hmm. Let us look at it from a different angle, the angle of non-catalog, mm -hmm. the angle of philosophical discourse. Now, this Ubuntu, you have a compound word. You have ubu on one side and ntu on the other side. When you look at this ubu, when you look just at this ubu, there is nothing sure at all. Ubu is the highest level of generality in ontological terms. Mm -hmm. That is one aspect about it. The second aspect is this one, and this is philosophically crucial. It is the point that precisely because it is ubu, it is hanging, it is in motion, mm -hmm. it is in permanent suspense of being. In other words, the philosophical point of departure for Ubuntu will be motion mm -hmm. and not rest. Mm -hmm. Now, because of the multiple possibilities of coupling ubu mm -hmm. with any, when you couple it with ntu, mm -hmm. you couple it with something that is normative in the sense that it has also an ontological reference point. And how do you arrive at an ontological reference point? Now, ubu is like many other words in our languages. It is like umu. One can say, for example, umu, and what? Umlungu, mm -hmm. meaning a white person, mm -hmm. right? But umu can also be coupled with ndu. Mm -hmm. And this is where I'm going. When you couple it with ntu, it becomes umuntu, mm -hmm. an ontologically, empirically recognizable being which we call a human being. Mm -hmm. Now, this human being shares something in common with the ntu of Ubuntu, because mm -hmm. we have the same suffix, mm -hmm. right? right? So having the same suffix means there is somehow insight identity there. And this one goes to the direction of Ubuntu must have in the ethical sense. And therefore, I will prefer even the word Ubuntu ought to have Ubuntu, mm -hmm. you see, in, in the, that's why I call it normative. Ubuntu is normative because its point of reference is Ubuntu. Mm -hmm. And Ubuntu has got the obligation um. to become ethical. Mm -hmm. Any Ubuntu who is not ethical is said to be some, a thing. We don't mean literally you are a thing. We see that you are a human being. Uh, Professor Ramosa, I one thing that has uh, uh, really interested me much in your work is the mm. fact that in the construction of what Ubuntu is, mm -hmm. you in fact draw upon a large body of knowledge, mm -hmm. uh, many of which or much of which is not African itself. Mm -hmm. Uh, you go to the Indian knowledge, to the Upanishads, and uh, you also use very preferably some eccentric traditions of the West, like David Bohm. The fact that Ubuntu has been developed on the basis of specific existential experiences mm -hmm. does not deprive the Ubu dimension of further encounters mm -hmm. with others. In the Western culture, people have focused solely on human rights and not on human duties. Right. While other cultures probably have overstressed 
yeah. the idea of human duties and not so much the human rights. Right. And these human rights are usually conceived of in an individualistic way. True. Uh, and that's why today we struggle for collective rights and the Constitution of Ecuador, as in Article 71, uh, declared for the first time mm -hmm. the rights of nature. Uh, because I was thinking, in the light of the title of your forthcoming book, if God were a human rights activist. Mm -hmm. You see, it set me thinking about these matters because I asked myself, would God be a, an activist in defense of the crimes against God? Uh, first, <laughs> it is the Christian God who is offended by those crimes. Mm -hmm. What happens in the name of human rights if those who do not believe in this God demand to exercise, this time, not witchcraft, but sorcery? No, I and take, I take very seriously <laughs> your criticism and your comment, which is a very fair comment that uh, uh, in my book, If God Were a Human Rights Activist, I start from a, a Judeo-Christian God, and therefore I have to reformulate or write another book based on other conceptions. As you know, here in South Africa and in many parts of Africa or in the world, many people say, well, South Africa, let it be as it is, because uh, they are scared that something like South, uh, Zimbabwe would occur here mm -hmm. in South Africa. Uh, besides, uh, Mugabe is not a model in a sense, uh, democratic, internal democratic. When we go to Mugabe, I'm glad you say you went to Rhodes. Of <laughs> course, the name itself of that university is in one of the men who's supposed to have established <laughs> Rhodesia. Now, Rhodes is a name, but a name that represented capital then, that still represents capital now. Mm -hmm. The capital that controls in Zimbabwe has got different names, but it is the same capital that controls here. Mm -hmm. Mugabe is like many other leaders, many other human beings, and many other politicians. He also has mistakes, many, many mistakes, political mistakes, just like Nkrumah had, just like Nyerere had. Mugabe is fighting Rhodesian economy in Zimbabwe in order to establish a Zimbabwean economy. From that point of view, it is difficult to say that Mugabe is actually destroying a Zimbabwean economy because an economy of Zimbabwe does not exist. It is in the making. It will exist after he has overcome the Rhodesian, the enduring Rhodesian economy which he is fighting now. Mm -hmm. If you doubt this, just do tell me of any single African country which at independence also at the same time obtained economic independence. Absolutely. Exactly. Thank you very much, Not Professor Omer. It was Not wonderful. Thanks, thank, you, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. It was much. a wonderful thank conversation. You. Thank, thank you so you. much. Yeah. yeah. We deserve yeah. it.